everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. I'm here in Pittsburgh with Josh. Um, it's actually been a long time since I've seen you. Last time was overseas. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your formal intellectual training. Um, I believe you just finished your degree, actually. Yeah, I just, um, just this past month finished my master's in English from Duquesne University here in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. um, my formal post-secondary academic journey began at Faith Builders. Um, I finished the teacher apprenticing program there in 2010 and uh, taught for a few years and I wanted to finish my degree kind of for pragmatic reasons but I also wanted to explore maybe some different fields you mentioned uh, talking internationally or, or, oh, or interacting yeah. internationally mm -hmm. um, so that was one area that I kind of wanted to feel out um, I actually took a class at George Mason University um, really? in what? global studies just okay. one class summer class but then it wasn't working to transfer um, because of faith builders their accreditation status and all that so I actually ended up that in 2013 I began at Regent University online was able to transfer mm -hmm. most of my work at faith builders um, to Regent um, and I chose to do a degree in English primarily for you know kind of pragmatic reasons but mm -hmm. it was also an area of interest of mine and um, I would say like with like as I started the degree program it was about that time that I began getting a vision for what uh, academics as an Anabaptist could look like. Most of this was actually spurred by a podcast recommendation from a friend of mine, um, the Christian Humanist Podcast. I began listening to that and it's a podcast where three Christian college professors, they just sit together and they talk about whatever text or ideas that they um, want to talk about on a kind of week-to-week -week basis during the, during the semester. And so this really fired my imagination for what faithful mm -hmm. scholarship as a Christian, as an Anabaptist, could look like. And it was at this point I began thinking about possibly doing, um, pursuing graduate education and pursuing like a traditional professor track. But then I got kind of sidetracked and ended up in, in, uh, in Israel working in Jerusalem um, for a humanitarian NGO for three years. And as actually at that, at that point that I finished my, my undergraduate work in 2016, but I decided to then pursue academics more formally um, and so I applied to Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, was accepted on a teaching fellowship, two-year teaching fellowship. Yeah, I just finished that, and uh, wow. it was a great experience, stretching and wonderful in, in every way. So the big question is, you know, we're talking about, you know, your pursuits in academia and so forth. Why do the humanities and that level of scholarship, why does that matter? And particularly, like, what can Anabaptists gain from this? One thing for us humanities folks, um, it's always a bit hard to answer because Mm. Uh, we feel like, well, if it's not obvious, you just won't get it, right? <laughs> if you have to ask, you know. No, it, it's, it's actually a very good question. Um, and, but if you, let's just zoom back a little bit and think about humanities, like where it mm -hmm. comes from originally. You know, humanities was initially, in the kind of classical education, was just a designation to dis distinguish it from like divinity, like the study of theology or study of God. Oh, so, uh -huh. so, I mean, when we're talking about humanities, we're talking about human, kind of human-based knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So philosophy, literature, linguistics, mm -hmm. history, and then to some degree also like the soft sciences, right? Like anthropology, um, psychology. So for me, it's really connected uh, to kind of the fundamental, I guess, doctrine that I would root it in would be would be the doctrine of imago Dei, of humans being created in the image of mm -hmm. God. and. Mm -hmm. Um, Dorothy Sayers has this really interesting point that she makes in The Mind of the Maker um, where she says, well, what are, we, what are we supposed to make of that? Like the only context, the only clue that we have as to what that means in its context in Genesis is that God is crea creating, right? And so therefore humans, you know, create. And this is particularly getting into the humanities as, you know, the arts, right? Humans, uh, yeah. humans creating things, doing, doing things with stuff, making things, making culture. That's kind of the, that's kind of the background. Um, for me, uh, uh, kind of a central kind of guiding verse, if you want to call it a proof text, you can call it a proof text, but it's, it's from Psalm 111, uh, where it talks about, great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. And in the context, it's mm -hmm. talking about, you know, the works, the historical works of God that God did for the children of Israel. For me, I, I see humans as kind of the, you know, in the, kind of the traditional medieval way of, you know, the crown of creation, right? And, and, and with the doctrine of Imago Dei enjoying a kind of proximity, a close proximity to God. And so therefore, the stuff of human culture um, worth paying attention to, worth thinking about, uh, wrestling with. Really, the question, kind of at the core of all this, is what does it mean? What does it mean to be human? What is the human experience, and like how have people uh, across cultures and across time wrestled with that, thought about that? So I, I think that's kind of the. It's not really specifically Anabaptist, anything Anabaptist about sure. that, right? But but that's kind of you know, where I come at it. The question of humanism. One of the things that has really fired my uh, imagination with this 
is, is the idea of what's, what um, um, Norman Clausen and Jen Zimmerman in this book, The Passionate Intellect, uh, uh, um, what uh, they call incarnational humanism. Their thesis of, the, of this book is that only the incarnation enables a recovery of humanism as the heart of university education because the incarnation allows us to retain the best elements of the greater humanist tradition and of its postmodern critics without repeating their shortcomings. Human dignity, the dignity of nature, and the interpretive nature of truth become possible without fragmentation or totalization. And when they're talking there about human dignity, the dignity of creation, but also interpret like truth as interpretation, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I think we do well to recognize is that, you know, another scary kind of boogeyman, if you will, is, is you know, is postmodernism, right? Well, yeah, 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 and so, you know, obviously has its problems, especially if you're coming at it from a, from a Christian um, point of view. It also levels some really good critiques against, like, enlightenment rationalism, this idea that we can have knowledge as somehow this kind of disembodied rational yeah. um, knowledge. And when the reality is, is, that, is that knowledge and even reason is always mediated through texts. It's always mediated through, hmm. through bodies, through people, through traditions. Um, there is an affective element, an aesthetic element to knowledge mm -hmm. that calls into question this ability to access truth from this kind of mm -hmm. um, completely cerebral detach perspective and mm -hmm. I don't I don't see that as a threat I mean it potentially I, like the kind of the, the direction postmodernism takes that is is to say well then we can't know anything for sure there you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there is nothing that we can know for certain and so then what you're left with is to deconstruct you know everything you know it's just about a matter of being ironic and you know playing with language and make to make it do what you want to do um, the alternative to that I think is 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 worship and mystery and humility and I think here again is something that, that maybe we could bring to the conversation to recognize that we are limited in our understanding of, of knowledge, uh, our understanding of truth. Um, and that's something I've been thinking about lately is, is actually the difference between like understanding versus like perceiving. Um, understanding is like et etymologically, uh, I haven't worked this all out, so I'm kind of working it out you know, as we talk, but like sure, sure. etymologically it's, it's you know, it's, it's to stand under or to stand in front of versus perceiving or apprehending as a kind of grasping or a kind of taking a hold of. And so um, when you reach the point of understanding is when you, it's almost like a posture of, of submission of standing in front of or standing in, in kind of unknowing or mystery in some way. Yeah. And um, it has an element of worship to it, I think, that, mm -hmm. that I think is missed in like the very in a more, I guess, a cerebral mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. approach, or limiting yourself to that. Oh, so, that right, I, wow, I'm, I'm that, kind that of all over the <laughs> all over the map here. Well, but. that's great, though. Like, that's really interesting because that's actually one of my considerations. You know, I'm back in college too, and mm. and here's these fields of study, these different things that are having massive effects mm -hmm. on our culture. Right. And hey, could the Anabaptists, you know, have some responses to this? Maybe we have something to bring to the table right. too. You know, right. and I was I always found that intriguing. So one of the things when we were emailing before this, you had mentioned how um, academic pursuits, the humanities, there's an intersection between that and cross-cultural engagement. Could you talk about that personally for yourself? How has your academic involvement um, enabled you in the cross-cultural element? One of the things that I've noticed, it, especially with Anabaptists, and this is getting more specifically to um, Anabaptism, is when we, t when we talk about like doing work internationally or working cross-culturally. We do very well, I think, at talking about how to how to speak in a, the language of a particular culture that we're trying to communicate with. What this often ends up doing is appreciate, is fostering an appreciation then for that culture's particular idioms, um, that culture's way of thinking, the stories, um, the art that has shaped that culture. But I don't see that so much, that kind of attempt being made so much with Western culture, especially Western popular culture. And when I'm talking culture, I'm talking literature, um, art, music, film, mm -hmm. stories, all of that kind of wrapped up into one. I don't know, I don't know, I don't really know why this is. I, don't, I haven't really developed a, a strong enough thesis. Maybe it's because we see ourselves so much as already a part of that culture that we need to be like countercultural. I think there's a limitation there when we don't try to at least understand, you know, the people around us. Um, we all, we are like countercultural in many ways, right? As, as I see it, like so far, Anabaptists have taken kind of two steps to culture, uh, two approaches. Um, one is 
what I've been talking about, like the counterculture, kind of against culture, mm -hmm. it's either kind of irrelevant or marginally useful or mm -hmm. dangerous actually, right? The, 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 the other approach is kind of complete acculturation, just kind mm -hmm. of uncritical consumption. So we either watch movies or we don't watch movies, you know, <laughs> but we don't, yeah. or we either read Harry Potter or we don't watch, or don't read <laughs> Harry Potter. Um, I don't see us like thinking very um, deeply or coherently like as a culture about, about how we engage. And so I, what I would hope to kind of promote um, for, for my people is more deliberate like participation mm -hmm. kind of or critical engagement, or at least make like an attempt to understand. Because first of all, there's a lot of, you know, if I may say it, there, there is a lot of truth, a lot of goodness, a lot of beauty that's created by people who are not like us, right? Mm -hmm. I think we, we see that with, we can see that with like international cultures. I think we're less apt to see it with, with, with our own culture. That opening up a, a bridge for communication, for understanding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mentioned I taught uh, first year writing and it's amazing to me um, the level at which my students, um, so what they're, you know, late teens, early twenties, you know, freshmen coming out of high school, you know, they've been they've been deeply, deeply shaped by, um, you know, by Harry Potter, <laughs> by um, Avengers, you know, and like, like frankly, there's like a cultural gap there, you know, as somebody who grew up in a in a more conservative environment, mm -hmm. um, you know, there like there's there's this kind of a gap there that, that I completely missed. Well, you might, you could say maybe that, maybe it was good that I missed that. Maybe I can show them, you know, maybe it's not worth, you know, getting, mm -hmm. uh, having that experience. But I think we, we too easily just kind of reject mm -hmm. um, instead of trying to at least understand. Like untangle it. Yeah, almost. if for nothing yeah. else, if, we're not, if only for pragmatic reasons yeah. like to, yeah. to understand. <laughs> I, I think, you know, there's, there's often more there than what we give it credit for being. But mm -hmm. um, I reali also realize that might not be you know, widely shared <laughs> idea, but um, it would be something I would at least hope. Um, and, and especially for our people, um, I think it's something we have to reckon with. I mean, not to be, um, I, don't, I don't like a, kind of the doomsday approach that, oh, we're just so connected, we're becoming acculturated. But um, if we're going to have like, you know, mobile technology, access to the internet, whereas in the past, like kind of our countercultural um, more conservative groups haven't had the uh, access uh, to you know uh -huh. mass media. That gap is is narrowing. I would um, advocate for um, I guess more just more critical engagement with it instead mm -hmm. of either mm -hmm. kind of the hand wringing that oh my goodness what's happening mm -hmm. um, or, or or kind of sticking our head in the sand pretending you know yeah. that we're not being shaped by this because we are like yeah. I mean we really really are like being shaped by this and you know, especially young people. Yeah, and endeavoring to understand well, maybe. Right. That, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And I mean you're you're going to be pulled in a direction regardless. Like, you know, you mm -hmm. you you choose the media that you consume, you're going to be pulled especially in the polarized world uh, America that we are in right now, you're going to be pulled in one direction or the other and I would I would like to think that we could, you know, have a kind of a third way in may, of maybe um, critically engaging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, offering a different perspective, being thoughtful about it. Yeah, maybe like participating, engaging, analyzing, thinking right. through. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I don't have a lot of easy answers. Like I'm not just saying. I'm not saying, you know, you throw open the floodgates and you know, <laughs> read um, Harry Potter. And, or or you know, well, yeah, Avengers or and, you know, <laughs> but or just immerse yourself in pop culture, right? Um, right. Yeah. All of that needs to be worked through at a, you know, I think at a local community level, you know, in mm -hmm. in conversation with with community and mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit, right? But sure. um, I think we do ourselves a disservice when we, when we, when we cut ourselves off that dramatically from, from mm -hmm. the culture around us. So going off of that, pivoting a little bit, but what is one piece of literature or something in your studies um, that you feel has impacted you the most? I am going to go the biblical route. <laughs> um, okay. yeah. Give two examples um, from, from the Bible that really have kind of shaped uh, my thinking about culture and engaging culture. Uh, Daniel and his friends in Babylon. Oh yeah. Um, they are, they are given, you know, their rations, and they're given a program of study. You need to learn the language and the literature of the Chaldeans, right? Mm -hmm. And they come out on the other end of that, very, very well studied. You know, three years hmm. having studied the language and literature of the Chaldeans, and they're known for their wisdom. 
and their ability to interpret dreams. And obviously it says, you know, this is something God gave them, sure. but they also put sure. it in the work. They're being faithful to the God of Israel. Um, you know, they're keeping kosher, right? They're in a foreign land, but they're, they're learning and able to use um, the literature of that of that culture in, in mm -hmm. meaningful ways. And again, what does this mean um, for us? That's, some, that's, that's, yeah, that's wow. where yeah. the interpretation needs to happen. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the conversation needs to happen. But I think that's, that's something that's kind of just, uh, that biblical story has, has been powerful for me. Mm -hmm. But also, and maybe, maybe more, more impacting or more central is, is Paul, uh, Paul's sermon mm -hmm. on Mars Hill. Mm -hmm. And in the course of his, his, his sermon, he, he quotes um, two separate uh, Greek poets, pagan poets, if I can read it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, please. So yeah. I, have it, I have it right here. So Paul here, he's, he's talking um, about, you know, where God is mm -hmm. in, in, in the world, in the cosmos. And then in verse 27, yet he is actually not far from each one of us for, quote, in him we live and move and have our being. And that quote there is from, um, a, from, a, from a Greek poet. And then he continues, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, and so forth and so on. Oh, so yeah, he's, yeah. He's, it's like he's, he's weaving these poets, he, in a sense, like taking them, taking the wisdom that's there, using it to speak to them in their own idiom, in their own way. Yeah. And it's not just, I don't think it's just, again, it's not just a pragmatic kind of, you know, sales pitch, right? You know, you need to grease the wheels here. Like, you know, I see that as another example of, you know, a faithful believer. I mean, like the kind of founder of Christianity in some yeah. ways, like institutional Christianity, um, using, using the wisdom that's there. And, you know, ultimately I think it comes back to, the, it's kind of cliche, but you know, all truth is God's truth, right? Um, so those have been kind of the, mm -hmm. the formative ones for me thinking about specifically like cross-cultural um, uses of the humanities as well as um, benefiting personally. So we're going to flip that around then mm -hmm. and, and because one of the concerns people have is, okay, so we've seen that the upside, the cross-cultural right. engagement, these scriptures you're right. using, but then they say, well, what about these secular ideologies or maybe, un, um, you know, ideologies coming through in literature, art, how, whatever it is right. that we don't agree with. Right. How do we handle that? Yeah. How, how would you respond to that? Yeah. First, I will say that by almost by definition, the humanities are like secular in the sense that they are like about humans and not about mm -hmm. the divine. So like almost by definition, there, there's a kind of secularism there. But I think what you're talking about is like ideological secularism, like this idea that we can't bring in any kind of or, or, or that like this is the way the world is. Right. And, and this kind of ideological approach. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there is a de facto kind of secularism you know, within the university. Um, that I think you need to you know, be aware of going into, and and sure. uh, but I, what I would reckon, I think sometimes it gets overplayed and caricatured. What I would say to somebody who's considering you know studying this at the university level is first of all root yourself in um, in a faithful community, um, ideally somebody who uh, or a community who has in, that includes both you know academically inclined as well as non academically inclined right. people. You don't want to be lonely, but you also need people to kind of you know, keep you rooted. The other one, another you know, piece of advice would be to, or I, I guess you know, backing up, like along with that, um, also like surround yourself with, with other people within the field, like both from the past and the present. Like one mm -hmm. other thing about the humanities that you realize, especially like English literature, you go into it and like most of these people, like especially the older stuff, like most of these people are working within the parameters of a, of a functionally Christian uh, uh -huh. perspective worldview. Uh -huh. Um, so like all of my like most of my work actually that I did at Duquesne was with like George Herbert who was a you know 17th century devotional poet and mm -hmm. you know theology of Lancelot Andrews who was a, a pastor during that time. It's not like it's you know completely secular. So yeah, um, surround yourself with people like, like I was saying both from the past as well as the present who have demonstrated mm -hmm. like faithfulness in scholarship as well as in you know, like in their Christian faith and their in their in their devotional life. Mm -hmm. And so I was you know. You know, mentioning like Herbert, George Herbert, John Donne, you know, some of those, some of those um, 17th century poets that I really found myself, you know, gaining an appreciation for. Of course, you have like uh, Lewis, C.S. Lewis, uh, G.K. Chesterton, Tolkien, Sayers, kind of that group of, um, of British intellectuals that um, I think our people are 
usually fairly familiar with. Roger Lundin, he was a uh, professor of English at Wheaton, Wheaton College, wrote some really amazing books that have been influential for me, um, beginning with the word, culture of interpretation, where he really gets into these, you know, these he really wrestles with like, Modernism and postmodernism, questions of interpretation, uh, yeah. um, but just from a very deep and rich um, you know, Christian framework. It was always helpful for me hmm. as I was pursuing having these per, uh, these questions, pursuing these yeah. this, these um, degrees to have kind of a, a you know cadre of people from like, like the past as well as the present, mm -hmm. even if you're not like with them you know in flesh, to kind of right, yeah. you know help you think. You know, mm -hmm. in, in ways it's like I think I really think thinking happens in community. Knowledge happens in community. Like, like, yeah. um, and and again, that's something I think Anabaptists bring to the table is this this understanding that we don't like access truth and knowledge very well mm -hmm. by ourselves off. You know, with only our brain, and you know, you you pretty much you're pretty soon end up in some pretty deep rabbit holes about <laughs> your questions of like what can I trust and what do I know and how yeah. do I know right? But um, but if you know. Postmodernism has done any good. It has highlighted the the communal um, mm. nature, uh, embodied nature of truth, and maybe just like referring to these other people that have wrestled through some of these mm -hmm. things before. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. Right. That's a good these point. questions aren't new. <laughs> you read the Greek, <laughs> Greek philosophers, and most of this stuff is just recycled <laughs> like in different contexts. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Root yourself in a, in, in a community. Um, be honest with yourself about what you want. Also, ask like, what type of person do I want to become? And that's one of the things mm -hmm. that, I, for me, has been helpful. And you know, I, I look around and like, who do I want to become? Well, you know, yeah. um, there are there are examples there that that are worth emulating. Mm -hmm. um, be willing to live with tension. Be humble. Don't go into it thinking that you have to immediately destroy every argument that somehow you know feels wrong. Um, be willing to live with that tension. One of the things that I found is is that you know, quite, uh, coming in good faith, you're usually more than welcome, you know, in in yeah. in in those yeah. in in a more secularized um, university setting. You know, we have these kind of caricatures, right? Of you know, God's not dead. You know, movie. I don't know if you're familiar with it, <laughs> sure, but like you know, sure, the, yeah. the professor who's just out to destroy the student, and the student who like owns his professor. You know, after studying, you know, some online apologetics courses, and like, yeah. you know, you might run into a professor here or there, um, but by and large, that that is just. Um, I would just encourage you to like encourage people to just avoid that kind of culture wars mentality. I think it's just overall kind of destructive. You know, I have learned to be able to to read and understand um, people who you don't agree with necessarily. I mean, I tell my, my my writing students that that you should be able to repeat the arguments of your opponents better than you know as good or better. Um, <laughs> than yeah. they do yeah. and you know, take them in good faith and then engage in that kind of dialogue. So mm -hmm. I, I think those would be mm -hmm. um, you know, some, of the big, some of the big points that I would yeah. recommend. Is there anything else you would like to add before we wrap up? One of the things that, if I could just read a few verses um, sure. here at the end. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that I kind of kept in front of me as I was going into academia. Um, something I um, want to keep in front of me. There, there are two scriptures. Uh, the first is, um, Proverbs 4 uh, verses 7 to 9. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom and whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. So, like, there's, this, mm -hmm. there's this scripture about like, just, I mean, get wisdom, get insight, get knowledge, yeah. like pursue it all the way. There's also a verse in the scriptures from Ecclesiastes 1 verse 18, and I applied my heart to no wisdom and to no madness and folly. I perceive that this is also that this also is but a striving after wind, for in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So, um, you know, a little bit, you know, however you want to take those. Um, I like to think of scripture as having a plurality of voices, and like, if you want to keep kind of a final, I guess, advice for whatever it's worth, you know, keep those two kind of visions of knowledge, of academics, of wisdom, of understanding, kind of intention. Like, on the one hand, it's, it's worth giving yourself to completely. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, it's not everything, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and depending on how it's pursued, it can just lead to a whole lot of pain and, mm -hmm. pain and sorrow. And, um, I can testify to both of those. <laughs> <laughs> Balance in all things, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Attention in all or things. Or tension, tension, yeah, yeah. It's, it, you know, yeah. it's, it's that inability yeah. to rest, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. 
Wow. Well, this has been great. Thanks so much for sharing. Thanks I for learned a me. lot. I think a lot of people will learn from this as well. So thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm.